often we hear so many different theological positions on speaking with tongues. But today I want to address to you the tongues question. And today, as we continue to enter in to the time of the power of Pentecost, the overflow from the Pentecost season, we are getting ready for a miraculous move of God in this time of revival. Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Corral, and today I want to speak to you about the tongues question. Did you know that it's very clear in the scripture that there is the sign of speaking in tongues and also the gift, the charismatic gift of speaking in tongues? And are these both the same? Is the gift of speaking in tongues that is spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the same miraculous manifestation of tongues that happened in the upper room? Is there confusion concerning the gift of tongues? So often we put all tongues together and we really don't know what the scripture actually means. But today, by the grace of God, I want to share with you not only from the biblical evidence, but also from historical evidence, what the actual miraculous manifestation of the sign of tongues is, and also the difference between the sign of tongues, which is a sign to the unbeliever, and speaking in tongues, which is the prayer language that God gives to his children that is completely different in function and unction. So let's begin today before I take you live to the service in Anaheim. We are in a time of revival and I pray today that as you view this telecast, as you view uh, this move of God today, that the anointing will fall on you. I pray that as you learn the word of God, that the same thing that happened in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard the word that you today will come up into a complete new anointing through revelation and through knowledge. Let's look at the word of God. Today, we are going to look at the tongues question very quickly before we go live to the service. First of all, the classification and the miraculous manifestation of speaking in tongues must be clarified. So let's go to what actually happened on the day of Pentecost. Let's look at the scripture. The Bible tells us, beloved saints, in Acts chapter 2, we all know it like the back of our hand, but I'm going to share it with you for the sake that do not know it, and we're going to compare in context what happened on the day of Pentecost, which I believe very clearly is the sign of speaking in tongues, which operates differently because tongues are a sign to the unbeliever, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. But is that the same miraculous manifestation of the charismatic gift of tongues? Are the gifts of the Spirit classified identically with signs and wonders? I want you to understand there is a slight difference in the scripture. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to build the body of Christ. They are means of consolation and comfort as the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 works together to the edifying of itself in love. But the signs and wonders we must understand are specifically for unbelievers. So therefore, we may see the same miraculous manifestation, but a different function for a different unction. Don't let me confuse you. Let's go to the word of God right now so we can completely understand the tongues question. Looking at Acts chapter 2. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it parted and sat upon each of them. Now watch this. 
and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke with other tongues as the spirit, Apathen Gome, gave them utterance. Now, what we see happen from that place, the Bible tells us immediately after being filled with the spirit and speaking with not unknown tongues, but other tongues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we see the specific reference to the prayer language as unknown tongues. No man understandeth him. But we see on the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost was a different unction for a different function. The day of Pentecost was the sign to the unbeliever. They left the upper room. They went down into Jerusalem because it was the Hebrew feast of Pentecost. And watch what happened. The Bible tells us they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues, not unknown tongues. And the Bible says, and the scripture says, and they were all amazed and they marveled, saying to one another, behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? How is it that we hear every man speak in our own tongue? Wherein we were born, Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, in parts of Libya and Cyrene, strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, do hear them speak, now watch this, in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. Notice the tongues that were spoken of on Pentecost were not unknown tongues. They were known tongues. They were the tongues of men. They were tongues that when they came out of the upper room, they went down into Jerusalem, began to magnify God and spoke in other tongues. Now, in, in other tongues, meaning tongues that were tongues of men, but not unknown tongues. You say, Dr. Corral, what does that look like? First of all, one of the ways we can actually see what that looks like is that if we document revival history and we see some of the events that happened when the Holy Ghost fell in Azusa Street, we will see that exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost repeated itself. It happened again in Azusa Street. As a matter of fact, some of the testimonies that have been documented by some of the most, most distinguished church historians, church historians that were professors at Fuller Theological Seminary, other church historians, such as the late revered Dr. Vincent Sinan, who wrote the book, The Century of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Sinan would be in modern times an actual equivalent, if you will, to the early church historian Eusebius. So therefore, it's very important that we look at the documentation that has been left for us from reputable, it very, very carefully calculated documentation on church history. And we see in the Azusa revival, this is so exciting, that the, Bi that the Bible is actually fulfilled. We see one testimony, a young man, 12 years old, little young guy, came into Azusa Revival. The Spirit of God fell on him. Oftentimes, Bishop Seymour would not lay hands on those to receive the baptism in the Spirit. The baptism in the Spirit just automatically happened when people came into that revival. They would be praising God, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God would fall upon them. They raised their hands and broke out speaking in tongues. Such was the case of this little boy, 12 years old, raising his hands, praying in tongues, tears running down his face, and in the audience sitting next to him was an older man. And this older man spoke broken English. He was actually a Mayan Indian. And when that little boy was raising his hands and praying in tongues and his tears running down his face, he did not know he was speaking perfect Mayan language. And the man next to him 
actually heard that while that little boy was praying in tongues, God was calling out the name of that man in the Mayan language, telling him to repent, telling him to come to the Lord, telling him to give his life to the Lord. And that man ran to the altar and gave his heart to the Lord. You see, this is the actual manifestation of other tongues. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. We also have documentation that was done by Dr. Ralph Wilkerson from Melody Land Christian Center, who is now in heaven, who in the 1970s had the largest Christian center in all of California, who was known for the charismatic, incredible works of the Holy Spirit through Melody Land. And we see, beloved saints, he did a documentation along with Dr. Vincent, Vincent Sinan to see who, who actually, back in the 70s, was a survivor from the Azusa revival. And did you know, beloved saints, they found a man that was living in the time of the 70s, even as late as the 90s, whose parents were in the Azusa revival. And one time, this man's mother raised her hands, praying in tongues, and an African man was in the audience who said, this woman was speaking the dialect from my village, and he gave his heart to the Lord. So you see, this sign of tongues that happened in the upper room were tongues known to men. Did it happen anywhere else outside of Azusa? I want to tell you, yes. When my husband and I, in the 1980s, when the People's Republic of China was first opened, when we had smuggled Bibles into China, there was an opportunity that we had in one of the patriotic churches. We didn't want to go to the patriotic church, but we had no choice if we were going to preach the gospel. And we knew the interpreter would not interpret what we were saying. But after the service, they allowed us a few moments in a little patio area. And did you know that nine of the people that we had brought to the People's Republic of China that risked their lives to smuggle Bibles in for Christians in the underground church in this particular event that was not the underground church, but was a communist church, they left us alone in that patio for just a few moments. And we were speaking Mandarin to those people that never heard the gospel before. Beloved people, just as we saw it in Azusa, and we've seen documentation after documentation, and we've seen it throughout revivals, and we saw it in the upper room, even so the sign to the unbeliever that happened on the day of Pentecost can still happen today. So what's the difference in this tongues question between the sign to the unbeliever and the gift of tongues, which is the charismatic gift that is given to build up the body of Christ and that uh, actually when it is to be miraculously manifested in the church is either used as a personal prayer language to someone by themselves or when it is manifest in the body, it always is accompanied with an interpretation, which is a prophecy. Beloved saints, let's look at the difference. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. and 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him. Howbeit he speaketh in the spirit mysteries. We're going to finish this up in just a few moments. I want to go live to the service in Anaheim, and then I'll be back to, with you to further this particular unknown tongues. We're going to pray that you receive them. We're going to pray that the power of the Holy Ghost falls upon you. We're going to pray for the sick, and we'll be right back in just a few moments. We're not mourning over Twin Towers. What the na national mourning is in America is not just for Twin Towers. It is over someone's father who burned or who died in the Twin Towers and a little boy who's celebrating his 20th birthday and his daddy isn't there. Or for someone whose grandma was working in the Dean Witter office and she's getting married now 
grandma's not there. Or for someone who was waiting for mama to come home from work, who wor worked in the Twin Towers, and she never came home. And she's still working on closure on the tragedy of the Twin Towers. Only when we understand that the burning of the Twin Towers is not really about the Twin Towers. They can be built again even more gloriously. But what is so devastating to America is that you cannot replace a human being. And you cannot replace the damages of loss. How can you possibly compare a twin tower with the loss of a father or a mother or someone, little child who was playing or at, even at a babysitter's house and didn't know maybe even both parents never came home? This is the sense of loss. And as we think of that, it is only when we can understand Tisha B'Av. Because Tisha B'Av is not about a burning building. Tisha B'Av is about for every person that was living at the time of the burning of Jerusalem. It's about the loss of the presence of God. And you say, well, now it's about absence. And I want you to understand, really, saints, there are two kinds of absence. There is the kind of absence that produces longing, or there is the kind of absence where someone is not really missed. Someone, perhaps, if there is a huge, huge organization or a huge job, or say everybody in the whole school is going to the zoo, and you have one teacher that took the day off, of course you would miss the teacher, but you would still see everything is fine. There's, there's not really a sense of loss. It's just an absence. But when there is an absence with a sense of loss, then we have to understand that we are coming closer to connecting to what Tish above is all about and how it is actually related to the revival. Because you and I must understand, there is the kind of loss that is agonizing. And we must understand that revival cannot come to our lives unless we are in a place of agonizing the absence of the Holy Spirit who longs to come to us. Are you with me, saints? Are we just satisfied for what we experienced in church? Are our lives just mechanical? Are our, is our service to God a mechanical going through the motions of life and ministry? Or is there a daily fellowship with God and a daily encounter with his presence that we don't want to lose? You see, the Welsh Revival only came with great prayer before. And when Pastor Small of Los Angeles in 1906, before the Azusa Revival began, went to the Welsh Revival. Actually, it was 1905 because the Welsh Revival ended in 1905. It was only a year and a half. When Pastor Small went and he met with Evan Roberts. He asked him, how can we bring revival to Los Angeles? And Evan Roberts said, gather your people every single day for 15 weeks, every day. And have the people of God cry out to God, longing for God, agonizing prayer is what brings revival. Hallelujah. I want you to understand that's what brought in the Welsh revival. That's what brought in Pastor Small's revival that lasted for four months. That is what brought in Azusa. Azusa was birthed out of agonizing prayer for the coming of the Spirit. And so only when there is that sense of loss, 
just like the disciples as they watched Jesus go back up into heaven in the book of Acts. Now, beloved saints, I want you to understand they prayed and they prayed. And that is why the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. Because never has it been known that there would ever be a revival in the earth without precipitated power and prayer and agonizing prayer. You see, we know we're ready for revival. When we're agonizing for the presence of God, mourning and weeping and saying, God, we cannot live without you. We need a move of heaven. Are you with me? The second word that I want to bring to you is not only Ika. For the sake of those that don't understand Ika, Ika is the word how. And actually, the book of Lamentations in its original Hebrew form is not Lamentation. Lamentations is the Septuagint version of the ancient book written by Jeremiah the prophet which is entitled Eka. Eka in Hebrew means how. And there is another word, Jeremiah. If you study Jeremiah, if you study Lamentations, you study the works of Jeremiah, you will know that it is Jeremiah's prophetic agenda to always take us backwards. You say, what do you mean by that, Dr. Corral? He's always using specific phrases in the way that the structure of the text is, that is also found in other places of scripture, so that he might show us what he is saying by connecting one portion of scripture with another. This actually is a, a form of biblical hermeneutics, and in Hebrew, it is called Gezra Shava. And this word Ika which is actually three times in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1, the word how actually repeats itself three times because Jeremiah, before the city burnt, before the temple was burnt to the ground, before the sense of loss and agony came, he already prophesied that that would happen. And so therefore, he uses this word Ika, but he also wants that word Ika to be used because in another place of scripture, we also see the word I Ika. And that word I Ika, which is spelled exactly like Ika, is not just man crying out for God, but also Jeremiah is showing us that God is crying out for man. And that's what Aika is all about. If you go and follow Jeremiah, you will find that he leads us right back to Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see that the Bible says after Adam and Eve had partaken of the fruit, they hid themselves in verse 8, last line. It says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. How can you hide from the presence of the Lord? You can't. So therefore, Moses, when he wrote Genesis, is telling us there's two ways the presence of the Lord is manifested. One is omnipresence. You can't hide from omnipresence. Omnipresence is everywhere. The Bible says that the psalmist said in Psalm 139, if I take the wings of the morning and flee to the uttermost parts of the sea, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. That's omnipresence. So it wasn't omnipresence they were hiding from. It was from intimate presence. It was from another kind of presence. It was from the presence of having fellowship, from the presence of eating, drinking in the presence of God, from walking with God, from fellowship with God. They were hiding from the intimate presence of God. 
And we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, the words that God says to Adam and Eve. The Bible says they hid from the presence of, the, of Adam and Eve, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. And the Bible says, and the Lord God said, last line of verse 9 says, Adam, where are you? And translated into Hebrew, where are you is Aika. What does that mean to us? And what does that mean to revival? We must understand that revival, beloved saints, is not just us longing for the presence of God. But you see, in revival, God is looking for you. God wants to find you. God wants to call you. God is putting his hand on you. It is God's sense of absence. God is sensing the absence of your fellowship. God is sensing the absence of your total being, being surrendered to him. Do you understand, saints? The only way to understand this, beloved saints, is to go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2 will tell us what Aika is all about. Jeremiah chapter 2, God says, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. And say, thus saith the Lord, I remember the hesed. I remember the kindness of your youth. When you went after me, hallelujah, I remember the kindness of your youth and the love of your espousals. When you went after me in a wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Let's look at these two words that are very important here that will show us the meaning of Aika. First of all, God is saying, I remember you. And we're seeing some very important words, key words. You know, when you want to look something up on the internet, you need a key word, don't you? You want something to be really successful? Boy, if you are an expert in key words, you're going to get success in the world. You know, the more better you know the key words, the more success-oriented your campaign will be. Some people pay tens of thousands of dollars to learn the trending Key words. So important. But that's the world. There are key words in this verse that help us connect to heaven. And the first word is remember. The second word is, it says kindness, but it's really hesed, which is a word for love. I remember the love the third word is youth. The fourth word is love, which is not in Hebrew hesed again. It's ahava. And the Bible says, let's look at these four words. I remember, where have we heard these words before? Remember, love, hallelujah, and youth. Youth can be likened unto First works. Actually, youth can be likened unto first love. Because that's what this is all about. And here we see that Jeremiah is saying from God, I remember the love or the hesed of your youth and the love of your espousals when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. I'm so glad we're back. Let's look right now at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we can see what the scripture says, and notice the difference, the distinction between the gift of tongues, which is the charismatic gift that Paul is expressing here in 1 Corinthians 14, which is his thesis, on the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit from chapters 12 to 14 in 1 Corinthians. And what happened in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, not the gift of tongues, but the sign of tongues, 
completely different. Operation, completely different. Manifestation. Let's look and see this distinction. Here we see, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit he speaketh in the spirit mysteries. Notice, no man understands him. So that means it is not a language from this earth. That means it's not like the day of Pentecost when they spoke the Parthenians, when they spoke the language of the Arabians, when they spoke the language of the Elamites and all of the languages that uh, Acts chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 so eloquently elaborate for us. Here we see this is not speaking unto men because 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, speaketh not unto men but unto God. But yet in Acts, the Bible is telling us they are not speaking unto God. They are speaking unto men. They are magnifying God. But the Bible tells us that they were speaking the languages of men. And so therefore, we must conclude there's not a conflict. There's not confusion. The tongue's question is not an area of confusion. The tongue's question is clear and concise. One gift is to edify us, build up the body. And when it's exercised in the church, it must accompany the interpretation, which is always prophetic. A prophetic word that will come forth, first in tongues and then with interpretation. And then we see the, the sign of tongues, which is for the unbeliever, that we see miraculously manifested, not only on the day of Pentecost, but also in modern times. And especially this particular gift was miraculously manifested in the Azusa revival. Beloved saints, thank you for joining us today. We are so excited that you have joined us and I want to pray for you to receive baptism in the spirit. I want to pray for you to receive the gift of tongues and to be used in the missions for other tongues. Nothing is impossible with God. Raise your hands right now and just say, Holy Spirit, I want to receive the gifts, the unction, the power, the grace. I want the gifts of the spirit operating in my life. Raise those hands and begin to call upon God and just begin to magnify him in other tongues. He will give it. The Spirit will give you utterance as you desire to completely submit and receive the power to become a living witness for Christ, to lay your life down for the gospel. You will receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you to be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And Father, today I pray for the sick. I pray for those who have sick bodies. I pray for someone, Lord, today where believing God that the word of knowledge, I believe, is being miraculously manifested because the word of God has been spoken here on this telecast, not because of Michelle Corral. Michelle Corral has no gifts. Michelle Corral is nothing. But I want you to see that the Holy Spirit who will take the words of Jesus and he will show them unto you. His ministry is to make Jesus alive to you. We are witnesses of these things, but so is the Holy Ghost and his witness is not like the witness of men. He is proving to you right now Jesus is risen from the dead. Not Dr. Michelle Corral. I have nothing to help God with. But because the Holy Spirit is taking these words and miraculously manifesting to you Someone is being miraculously healed in their leg. Someone who has had a sore in their leg in the name of Jesus, it is healed today. And I believe several individuals that have been in a place of depression, and it hasn't been heavy depression, but it's been like a melancholy spirit. God wants you to know that it's just a, a transition time in your life. God is transitioning you, and the only, the only way that sense of 
of fulfillment is going to return to your life, beloved, is when you are able to understand the call of God on your life. Before you were born, he knew you and he called you to be his. He is bringing us back to the place of when he first put his hand upon our lives and we just give God the praise and the glory. Someone else in this very moment, pray with me, saints, all over the world because I sense the presence of God. This is not man. This is not Michelle Corral. Michelle Corral has no power. I want you to know it is only the Holy Spirit confirming the words of Jesus to show you Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He is living. He is not dead. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe someone who has had pain in the back of your neck is being totally healed. Someone in the UK today, I'm telling you people, there is gonna be a revival breaking out in the UK because God loves the UK. The UK is so on his heart and God is saying the land that burst out the revivals in the earth in the end times will birth out revivals again. God wants you to know he's not finished with you UK. He is gonna use the UK to raise up just like the Hebrides revival, just like the Welsh revival, just like the work with the Jeffrey brothers. I believe God is not finished and it's going to happen again in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Today, beloved, if you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you raise your hands and just receive Jesus right now? He loves you so much. He wants to use you for his glory. He will be your best friend. You can receive him right now into your heart in the privacy of your home. You can be free from sin, the bondage of sin, the addiction of sin by receiving him into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. You can have the assurance of being born again. Would you say this prayer with me? Wonderful Jesus, I completely submit my life to you. I ask you to come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Wash me free from sin. I want to receive you right now, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. If you said those words and you really believe that Jesus came into your heart, would you call the number on your screen? We love you so much, beloved, and we will see you very soon. And those of you who would like to become a worldwide Hesed partner, helping this ministry bring not only the gospel, but the love of Jesus in the form of water wells, in the form of daily feeding programs, in the form of refugee relief, in the form, beloved saints, of daily feeding programs and orphan homes. You can do that, and our announcer will tell you how. We love you, and we will see you very soon. Thank you for joining us on our telecast today. We want you to know that your love is greatly appreciated. We'd like to invite you to take this opportunity to donate to our Hesed Global Missions. Let the love of Jesus shine on you today. You can help our feeding programs in Masaka, Uganda and Kampala, Uganda, help educate children in India. We are raising up Christians who have been violated of their human rights in Pakistan through the Dr. Michelle Corral Sewing School. There are so many initiatives that need your seed. Become a part of HESED Worldwide Global Initiatives today. Text HESED to 77977 or visit our website, breathofthespirit.org and click donate to donate via PayPal. Thank you on behalf of the thousands that are helped every day by this ministry.